All right, well, it's just a little bit after uh, noon Eastern. So uh, while people are still coming in, I'd, I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker. We're very happy to have Professor Mimi Cole with us today. Uh, she's an exemplary example of somebody who's made a habit of asking and answering really important questions by integrating mathematical modeling and field experiments. And, uh, and I think that um, she's a, a great person for the attendees of uh, Life Sciences to, to see your work. Uh, Professor Mimi Cole uh, is a professor of the Graduate School in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and earned her PhD in zoology at Duke University. She studies how the physics of organisms interact with their environments, focusing on how microscopic creatures and uh, swim and capture food in turbulent water flow, how organisms glide in turbulent wind, how wave-battered marine organisms avoid being washed away, and how olfactory antenna catch odors from water and air moving around them. Professor Cole is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Her awards included a MacArthur Genius Grant, a Presidential Young Investigator Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, the John Martin Award, which comes from the Association of Sciences of, of Limnology and Oceanography for, quote, research that created a paradigm shift in the area of aquatic sciences. She's also won awards from the American Society of Bio Biomechanics, the American Geophysical Union, and the International Society of Biomechanics. Uh, Professor Cole, uh, I'd like to turn the mic over to you, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you uh, today about navigating in turbulent environments and embedding models in real world data. But before I get started, whoops, let's see. Uh, I have to make a disclaimer. I'm not a mathematician studying biological questions. I'm a data gathering and experiment doing biologist who loves to collaborate with mathematicians. Um, and I have a couple of goals for my talk today. One is to give you a biologist's perspective on how mathematical modeling helps us answer biological questions. But I'm afraid to say that this image depicts how most of my biological colleagues view mathematical modeling, but I'm not among those. Uh, the other goal uh, for my talk today is to tell you about one of our approaches for modeling biological processes that operate in the real world where they're in complex variable environments. So um, the body structures we study and the way they move evolved in the messy natural world, not in a lab. And out in the real world, they're uh, navigating complex terrains, they're exposed to wind and water flow, and other organisms. And all of those things change with time on a number of different scales. So the basic question I've been uh, trying to answer is how do organisms function in complicated real world environments that vary on a wide range of spatial scales and temporal scales? And today the example I wanna focus on is locomotion in natural habitats. So whenever an organism locomotes, it moves through the fluid around it, whether it's running or swimming or flying, and that fluid would be the air or the water in its environment. But when an organism locomotes in the real world, it encounters ambient fluid motion. So the, there's wind, water currents, and waves that it's negotiating. And so the basic question we've been asking is how does the interaction of the organism with its fluid environment affect how it moves through the habitat? And the system I want to focus on today is microscopic organisms swimming in turbulent flow. And until recently, studies of microscopic organisms have been uh, of two sorts. One are very fine scale models where the question that, uh, and this is both models and lab experiments, where the question is how do the organisms um, move themselves through the water. And these studies, there's no ambient flow. The other uh, category of um, uh, studies of microscopic organisms in flow are large scale field experiments and models. And there the question is, how are these organisms transported by turbulence and currents in natural bodies of water? And in these studies, the microscopic organisms are just treated as passive tracers carried by the flow. 
what I want to do is to couple these two different scales of fluid flow and ask how does the interaction between them affect where the organisms go and also the signals that they encounter along the way. Uh, the example that I want to start out talking about is, um, uh, I'll explain to you, many bottom-dwelling organisms like these corals and snails and barnacles can only disperse to new habitats by releasing microscopic larvae that are transported by ocean currents. And those transport uh, by the currents happens at large scale of kilometers to hundreds of kilometers. But to recruit to a new site on the seafloor, larvae have to settle out of the water column. And this is a process that takes takes place on a spatial scale of meters. Where larvae actually settle out of the water column onto the seafloor is really important ecologically. For one thing, it uh, uh, determines the geographic distribution, dynamics, and genetics of populations of different kinds of animals that live in the ocean. And then if we focus just on a particular site, uh, where larvae settle affects the composition of the communities of different species of organisms living together on the bottom. So it's an important ecological process and we want to understand the mechanisms. But why should we use larvae to study swimming in turbulence as opposed to other kinds of microscopic organisms? Well, one is that they're weak swimmers relative to the ambient flow, and so the interaction of ambient flow and their swimming is likely to be important. And the other is, unlike a lot of planktonic organisms, settling larvae trying to land in the right place have some place specific they're trying to go. So navigation might be important to them. So how do larvae move from the water column onto suitable habitats on the seafloor? And again, this is a problem with a spatial scale of meters. And there are two schools of thought that um, uh, argue with each other. One school of thought said larvae are just passive tracers. They're such lousy swimmers that they carry where, they're carried wherever the water go and some get lucky and hit the right spot on the seafloor. The other school of thought said larvae are complex animals that respond to all kinds of things in their environment, and they swim towards odors from the benthos. And by odors, I simply mean dissolved chemical cues in the water. So this might be the perfume from their prey or, for, or from members of the same species. So uh, which is it? Uh, we started out studying this using this beautiful sea slug, Festilla sabogi. Festilla are voracious predators, and you see some here sitting on their prey, Parides compressa, and they eat only one species of coral, Parides compressa. So it's critical that their larvae land on coral reefs where that species, Parides, is abundant. So this is a good candidate for um, a kind of larva that would have to land someplace very specific. This is an orgy of festilla, literally. And the net result of this orgy are these egg masses, which after about seven to eight days hatch. And what emerges from these egg cases are these little larvae. This uh, larva is about 200 microns in length. And uh, it uh, has these Mickey Mouse ears, which is the swimming organ, the ciliated velum, which is how they propel themselves through the water. And these guys uh, ride around in the plankton for about three or four days. And after that, they become developmentally far enough along to be what we call competent, which means that they're now finally able to undergo metamorphosis into the bottom dwelling slug form if they land in the right place. So can competent larvae of uh, Festilla use Parides coral smell, that is the dissolved chemical cue from the corals, to help them land in the right place in nature? And to ask whether larvae can use smells in nature to help, help them land in the right place, we have to figure out several things. One thing we need to know is what's the water flow like in the field where they live. Another thing we need to know is what's the dispersal of coral smell in that water flow in the field. 
A third thing we need to know is what larval behavioral responses might there be to dissolved coral smell. And then what we have to do is put all that information together and say, do the responses of the larvae to coral smell affect where they land when the smells and the larvae are being carried by ambient water flow. So let's start out thinking about water flow in the field. This is my field site. Unfortunately, I have to do this work in Hawaii. This is uh, Kaneohe Bay on the island of Oahu. And uh, it uh, has many different patch reefs within the bay, which means I can do replicate experiments on different reefs all in the same general flow habitat. And one of the first things we did was measure water velocity profiles above and within coral reefs. And let me show you an example. This is a Parides reef. We used acoustic Doppler velocimetry to measure water velocity at different heights above the reef where these stars are indicating. And let me just show you an example of water flow measured two centimeters above the reef. This is a plot of horizontal velocity as a function of time. And notice that zero is here. And what we see is the flow moves shoreward and the flow moves seaward back and forth. And this is flow typical of waves. And actually, I'm just showing you the horizontal component, but wave motion is orbital, like so. And then you see all these squiggles on the um, uh, flow record. These are uh, velocity fluctuations due to turbulent eddies of different sizes. So one of the things we need to do is quantify the temporal pattern of flow fluctuations so we can replicate it in the lab. And to do that, we do a spectral analysis and we can plot how much of the variation in velocity is due to fluctuations at different frequencies. So here's a spectrum for the flow data I just showed you. And we can see the signal of the waves here. And what you see here are turbulent eddies of different sizes in that flow. So we're going to have to replicate this when we uh, move into the lab. So to summarize what we learned about flow over the coral reef is that there's fast wave-driven turbulent flow over the reef where the peak velocities are a half to one meter per second. And so we have this orbital motion of the waves. But any of you who swim in the ocean know that those waves, even though the instantaneous velocities are fast, produce slow net transport shoreward. And coral reefs are full of holes. They're very porous and there's water in there. And we measured the flow in the reef and there's little orbits and they lead to very slow net flow through the reef. In addition, there's net flow up out of the reef over uh, bumps and convex surfaces and there's net flow down into the reef in depressions. So that's a summary of what the flow is like on the reef. So what's the dispersal of dissolved coral smell and flow like this? Well, we now know there's very slow flow through the reef, so we assumed maybe the water hanging out in the reef is there long enough to pick up some odors from the coral. So we went out and slurped up water samples with uh, long tubes that we inserted into the reef, and we brought those back to the lab and asked the larvae if they reacted to um, that water and they can react by undergoing metamorphosis and they can show behavioral changes I'll tell you about in a minute. So anyway, we collected the water from the reef, brought it back to the reef, the larvae responded, and so we know that water in the reef does contain Q that Parides coral are there. Uh, what happens to that smelly water in the reef? To study that, we labeled water in the reef with dye. And I'll just show you some pictures. They're more fun than, than all our graphs. But we would label the water with uh, dye. And after a few wave cycles, we see that the dye is slowly flowing up out of the reef. And there's a very um, steep velocity gradient at the surface of the reef and high shears. So that spreads the odor along the surface of the reef. And because the waves are going back and forth, the dye spreads in all directions. And so we figured that the water right above the reef might also contain Q. And when we took samples and brought it back to the lab and asked the larvae, indeed, it does contain Q.
So for ye, for, to us, the substances dispersing from the reef look like a diffuse cloud. And for years, people have been modeling odor plumes and odors coming off surfaces as a diffuse cloud. But we're big organisms, and the question I want to ask is, what's the Q distribution like on the scale of a larva who's only 200 microns long? So to get a handle at that, we have to take a much closer look at this uh, odor distribution, and we did that in a wave flume in the lab. And we're mimicking the turbulence spectrum and the waves and the velocity profiles measured in the field. I did this in the Environmental Fluid Mechanics Lab at Stanford, and here you see an end-on view and a side view of a coral reef that we built in the flume out of Parides skeletons. Then we needed something we could measure that would be an analog of the odor, so we painted the reef with a fluorescent dye that slowly dissolved into the water, much like the metabolites or odors leaking from the coral. And when we did that, we saw a cloud sheared along the surface of the reef, exactly like what we'd seen in the field. But remember, we're doing all this so we could see the odor distribution on a very fine scale. And to do that, we turned all the room lights off and we illuminated just one little plane of light uh, with a sheet of laser light. Uh, it's only a millimeter thick, so we're taking a millimeter thick slice out of that odor plume to look at it. And this technique is called planar laser induced fluorescence. So if I lapse into saying PLIF, that's what I'm talking about. Here's a frame of a video that we took during a PLIF experiment. You can see the corals down here and all this swirly stuff up here is the dye dissolving off the coral, which is our analog of Q. And you can see wherever it's black, there's no odor and where it's bright, there is odor. I've put a dot here to indicate where a microscopic larva might be. And so although it's what would look like the cloud to us, it, at this instant, is sitting in a black place where there's no odor, and if it swims here, it'll encounter a filament of, of Q from the coral. So that's what the dispersal of dissolved Qs looks like on the scale of a larva. What are the behavioral responses of a competent larva to dissolved Q? We did a series of experiments that I won't get into because I don't want to talk forever, but what we determined uh, was that in Q-free water, the larva swims. And what you see here is a side view of a larva and its Mickey Mouse ears are pointing out this way. So uh, he, that's the swimming organ. Um, so in Q-free water, it swims, but if it encounters a filament of Q greater than threshold concentration, it sinks. And so this animation will illustrate how the larva swims along, doodly doodly do, it encounters some odor, bloop, pulls in its swimming organ and sinks, but when it exits the queue, it starts swimming again. So the larva is basically a stupid little on-off machine. So that's the behavior. So does this on-off response to queue affect where larvae land when they're carried in ambient water flow? And to answer this, we need to look at the flow on a finer scale, the scale of millimeters, which is what's carrying the larvae. And we did that in a wave tank. So let me explain to you what these experiments were like. Here's the coral sitting on the floor of the wave tank. The water in the tank is making orbits, sloshing back and forth. These dots you see are neutrally buoyant marker particles that are illuminated by a sheet of laser light. And we make videos of their motion and then um, use those uh, in a technique called particle image velocimetry to plot the instantaneous velocity vectors uh, in the water over the reef. And in this picture, the uh, warmer the color, the faster the flow. And we do this simultaneous with uh, another camera that's doing PLIF. So you also see here instantaneous Q concentrations where the lighter the pixel, the higher the concentration. And let's see what this looks like with time. So here the waves are sloshing back and forth and you can see how the odor distribution and the velocity vectors change with time. 
So one of the things we see is that both the velocity and the Q concentrations change with time on a scale of fractions of a second to seconds. And if we look at any one instant, we see that both the velocity and the Q concentrations vary on fine spatial scales of fractions of a millimeter to centimeters. We can also use our data to calculate instantaneous velocity gradients and where those contour lines are very close together, larvae encounter high shear. Where they're far apart, they encounter low shear. And we found that the shear varies rapidly on the scale of seconds and spatially on a very fine scale of millimeters to centimeters. So what does shear do to a larva? Let's think about several cases. If a larva is just a passive, neutrally buoyant particle, the shear will make it rotate, but it will remain in the uh, parcel of water where it started. If it's a passive sinker, that is, it's negatively buoyant, the shear will make it rotate, but it still will have a net movement downward. Similarly, if it's a passive riser, it's positively buoyant, the shear will make it rotate, but it will keep going up. But active swimmers are very interesting because they have a front end and they're going in a direction. And so when the shear rotates an active swimmer, the direction of its swimming changes. So uh, with all that in mind, let's go back and think of our larvae, the little on-off machines. In odor-free water, they swim. If they encounter Q above threshold, they sink. And we want to ask, does this behavior affect where they go in the water over a coral reef? But unfortunately, they're only 200 microns long. They're too tiny to see in the field or in a flume. So here's where the mathematical modeling comes in. We can put model larvae that have the behaviors that we measured into our PLIF PIV data and see what happens to them. So we can calculate the trajectory of a larva in the following way. At each time step, the larval velocity equals its swimming or sinking velocity. And whether it's swimming or sinking depends on the local instantaneous Q concentration. So we look at the brightness of the pixel where the larva is, and we've calibrated brightness to concentration. So we can figure out if he's sinking or swimming. And the swimming direction depends on the local instantaneous vorticity of the previous time step, which is what the shear has rotated the, the larva to the direction he's going in. So that's what the larva is doing relative to the water around it, but it's tiny and it's being carried in that parcel of water. So we take this vector sum of what the larva is doing and what the local instantaneous ambient water velocity is to figure out boom, where the larva moves for the next time step. Then we advance the data and repeat. And by doing this uh, through the whole data set, we can calculate the trajectory of a larva in waves over a reef. So here's an example where the larva sinks in Q and swims in Q-free water. And remember where it's black, there's no odor, and the brighter and lighter the pixel, the higher the concentration. So here's the calculated um, trajectory of a larva in the um, flow and uh, odor concentration data that uh, we measured. So we can uh, do several things with this. We can pretend we're a larva and travel along with it on its trajectory and figure out the temporal pattern of Q encounters it has. So this guy was swimming along uh, with no odor. It's going to go through a patch of odor, then no odor again. And here's an example of the data we get if we follow a larva. This is Q concentration plotted as a function of time. And that's the threshold concentration. So above this, the larva reacts and below it, it doesn't. And so what we see is functionally, the larva encounters Q, no Q, Q, no Q, Q, no Q, Q. In other words, the larva encounters an on-off pattern of encounters with the Q. Uh, what I showed you is data for a larva that's about 10 centimeters above the reef. If we follow a trajectory that gets closer to the reef, what you can see is that the frequency of encounters with the odor are greater. And once it's very close to the reef, it's basically 
in odor all the time. So what we've learned by trying to empathize with a larva at its spatial scale is that it encounters a gradient in the frequency of encounters with Q filaments as it nears the surface that's the source of the odor. So it's not a simple diffuse concentration gradient that people have modeled for years. Instead, it's a gradient in frequency of encounters with odors. Uh, we can also consider mechanical signals. Larvae will respond to things uh, uh, mechanical as well. And what you see plotted here is following the trajectory of a larva and looking at the acceleration it experiences as a function of time. And the green tracing is a trajectory that's five to 10 centimeters above the benthos, whereas the black one is larvae that um, are uh, closer to the, uh, the substratum within five centimeters. And what we see is just like with odors, the frequency of encounters with big mechanical signals increases as a larva nears a rough surface. And so um, uh, there are both mechanical and chemical signals telling the larva it's getting near um, a surface. So what we can now do is an agent-based model uh, where we calculate the trajectories of thousands of larvae at randomly chosen starting positions in the water. And um, then from that, we can calculate the rate of transport of larvae into the reef. And let's do it for larvae that sink in odor and compare that to doing it for larvae that do not respond to the odors, they just swim continuously. And when we do that using turbulent wavy flow measured over the reef and the Q concentration threshold that we know causes thinking, sinking, the model predicts that sinking in Q enhances transport rates into the reef by about 20%. So this really stupid on-off behavior is enough to enhance the uh, probability that these larvae will land in the right place. But this is a model. Can we test anything about the model in the field to uh, make our seals, cells feel a little better about what we're predicting? Well, there's a big assumption in the model that I didn't tell you about, and that is that larvae that sink into the reef are retained in water within the reef because they just keep sinking because the reef is full of odor. And um, we did a field test of this, and we can't do field tests with real larvae because real larvae are really hard to um, rear and it's impossible to get enough of them to do a field experiment. So instead we use plastic particles that sink at the same velocity as the larvae. And we released them upstream of reefs and asked, are they retained in the water within the reefs after the water that brought them to the reef has gone away. And so this is a cartoon of the experiment. This is the floor of Kaneohe Bay. This is a patch reef. Uh, the net flow of the waves towards the shore is as the arrow showed. And we had a big contraption that would release a column of dye so we could see how the water was moving and larval mimics. And then um, as this water and the mimics flowed across the reef, we sampled above and within the reef at uh, different positions in the reef at timed intervals. And here's an example of one of these experiments. I collaborate with Mike Hatfield at the University of Hawaii, who's a developmental biologist. So everybody in his lab is uh, wearing white lab coats and pipetting. But I offered them a boat ride to the reef and a picnic lunch, and I always got a lot of volunteers to come out and do these experiments with me. And again, I won't bore you with a lot of graphs, but to summarize what we learned, after the dye, that is the water that I released, has moved through the reef, the samples of water within the reef are full of larval mimics. So they are retained in the water in the reef. So that assumption is a good one. The model makes some predictions too that we can test in the field. One prediction is that more larvae should land on the seaward part of the reef than on the shoreward part of the reef. So we can do a field test and ask, is Festilla recruitment greater on the seaward parts of reefs than on the shoreward parts of reefs? 
Uh, fortunately, oceanographers care about Kaneohe Bay, and so we have a lot of information about net flow directions in the bay, both data and models. And um, in the center of the bay, uh, no matter what the tide is doing, there's always seaward to shoreward flow. So there's always a shoreward and seaward edge of the reef. So we did a three-year recruitment study at sites in this part of the bay. The problem is that new recruits are really tiny. They're only 200 microns long and they're the same color as the coral. So we can't just swim out there and count them. So what we had to do instead is each month we collected coral samples from the seaward and shoreward parts of reefs. Uh, and we brought those back to the lab and maintained them in separate tanks. And we didn't want any larvae recruiting from the seawater system, so we had to filter all the water with a five micron filter to keep everything out. And after about two weeks, those larvae that have settled grow into slugs that are about six millimeters long, which you can see. So we hired an army of undergraduates and uh, set them to work with hammers, breaking up the coral and counting the number of festilla that had recruited. And what you see here is a plot of recruits at these two positions on the reef. And what you see is more larvae recruit onto the seaward part of the reef as the model predicts. Um, so the model predicts, however, more larvae land on the seaward part of the reef, but our field tests tested recruitment, which could be due to landing, but it could also be due to the larvae saying, gee, I like the seaward part of the reef best, I'm only going to attach here. Or it could be that larvae on the seaward part of the reef survive better than on the back of the reef. So we needed another experiment to eliminate those two uh, cases. And so we did another series of experiments where we asked, where do larval mimics first contact reef surfaces? So we put sticky tabs like flypaper all over the reef and counted the number of mimics that settled on them. And this is the number of mimics per area for different positions on the reef. And what we found is more mimics land on the seaward part of the reef, just as predicted by the model. So we feel pretty good about what the model is telling us. So to summarize what I've said so far, if we think about water flow on the reef, um, it's wavy turbulent flow and there's slow flow through the reef and up out of the reef and that's all based on data. Then we did it, um, uh, measurements in flumes about the dispersal of dissolved Q and what we found is that um, the, on the scale of larvae, the odor uh, is distributed in filaments and that larvae encounter on off cue. And then we asked what responses of competent larvae are to brief encounters with Q. Our data told us that they sink in Q and swim when in no Q. And we used a model then to determine that that simple on off behavior enhances transport into the reef if parietes are abundant on that reef. So can larvae use smells in the water to help them settle in the right place in nature? What we learned for Festilla is that the answer is yes. They swim when there's no odor and sink and stink and the use of this simple on-off behavior enables them to navigate in a complicated environment and control where they end up. So sinking in queue is a good strategy if the habitat is below you like a coral reef, but it's a really lousy strategy if the habitat you want to colonize is above you, for example, the bottom of a ship. So to ask how um, larvae might land on a surface above them, we switched to studying the fouling community, which are all these creatures, sponges and tunicates and barnacles that grow on ships and on docks. And we asked, how do microscopic larvae carried in the water land on surfaces above them or next to them in harbors? So if you put your shiny new boat out in the water, or in our case, if we hang out uh, plates off of docks in a harbor, after about a month, uh, you see these um, 
organisms have colonized the surface. This is the early fowling community and it's mostly tube worms and flat bryozoans. And after uh, about three months, we start seeing bigger, lumpier organisms like sea squirts. And after a year, we see very big, lumpy organisms like barnacles and sponges. And so what you see is as the fouling community develops on surfaces, its roughness increases, which is going to probably affect the flow. And in fact, here are examples of side view profiles of the different stages in the development of a fouling community to show you how the roughness changes. So we did what we did on the coral reef in a harbor. Um, this ha field site is not nearly as appealing as Kaneohe Bay, but we used acoustic Doppler velocimetry to measure water flow across um, fouled surfaces on docks in Pearl Harbor. And then just as with the coral reef, we did PLIF PIV experiments in a wave flume where we replicated um, uh, the ambient flow and we put in uh, uh, those fouled panels that we had um, collected from the field. And, um, and then uh, using that data on the odor distributions and on the flow distributions, we could put larvae of, with different uh, behaviors into that flow. And so let me tell you an example where we looked at some simple cases. We looked at neutrally buoyant particles at swimming larvae and at passive particles that either were rising or sinking. And we'd start them at the same random positions in the water and calculate their trajectories in our particle image velocimetry data. And in this example, we have passive particles compared to swimmers. And this is after just 45 seconds, you can see that they're dispersing differently. It's not a random diffuse cloud at all, which is how people um, have modeled the dispersal of little particles like this. And you can also see that even after only a few seconds, swimmers are more dispersed than the uh, passive particles. So what's the effect of larval motion through the water on their vertical travel, which might get them to a surface above or below them? And uh, here's a plot of height above the substratum as a function of time for a bunch of model larvae in those data. And each line represents the trajectory trajectory of an individual larva. And you can see that they jiggle up and down as the waves carry them in their orbits, but they don't change their net height very much. In contrast, uh, passive sinkers jiggle up and down, but eventually go down, and passive risers go up. But the swimmers are very interesting. They go up and they go down and they go up and they go down because they're swimming into different eddies as they go and changing their direction. What's the effect of larval motion through the water on landing on a surface, which is what a settling larva needs to do? And what we did for this is count all the larvae that uh, landed on a surface as settled. And let's consider first a vertical surface like a piling, and let's consider an early stage fouling community and um, uh, it's exposed to wind chop, which is small waves uh, superimposed on a current. And uh, what you see here is the proportion of the larvae in our model that settled uh, for different behaviors. So here's the neutrally buoyant passive larvae, the swimmers that have their direction changed by local shear, the risers, and the passive sinkers. And what you see is swimming enhances settlement onto a fouling community compared to the other behaviors. What if the substratum is below the uh, larvae uh, rather than above them. This is again a plot of the proportion that land on a surface below them. And what you can see is passive sinking is the best, best way to reach a surface below you, but swimming is second best. And what about a surface above you? What you see is passive rising is the best way to reach a surface above you, and swimming is second best. 
Now let's think about escaping from the benthos and who might want to do that? It might be spawned eggs released by a mama, a benthic organism sitting on the substratum or of larvae that uh, are escaping from an egg case or it might be prey escaping from benthic predators. And again, if we look at the proportion that um, exit out the top of the uh, flow field in our model and therefore have escaped the substratum, what we see is passive rising is a great way to escape, but so is swimming. So let's sum up what we've learned so far from these simple models by asking why swim when you're tiny, slow, wimpy, and you're tumbled in a turbulent boundary layer. Why bother to swim at all? Aren't you completely overcome by what the ambient flow is doing? What we see is swimming and passive rising are the best escape from the benthos. We see that swimming is the best way to land on vertical surfaces. And we see that swimming is the second best way of landing on surfaces above or below you. In other words, swimming is the best landing strategy if surface location relative to you is unpredictable. So to summarize what we've learned then, if we put together the motion of microorganisms through the water, with how they're carried by realistic ambient flow and ask how the interaction of these two different scales of flow affect where the organisms go. What uh, we've done is to try to address this question by embedding models of behavior in real world flow and concentration data. And we've used the real world data because it's much more biologically relevant than some idealized model of isotropic turbulence, for example. So um, we address the question by embedding models of behavior in real world flow and concentration uh, data. And from that, we learned that the behavior of microscopic organisms can't overcome the flow, but it can bias how environmental flow transports them through the environment. We found that sinking in signal is a good strategy if the habitat you want to land on is below you like a coral reef. And we found that swimming in signal is a really good strategy if the habitat location is not predictable. For example, if you're a member of the fouling community that might land on a ship above you or a piling next to you. So how do real larvae react to um, rapidly fluctuating signals that indicate that a surface is nearby? Do real larvae behave the way we just predicted they should? And these uh, signals can be chemical or mechanical. And let me show you what we've learned so far. If we look at Festilla larvae, the sea slug on coral reefs, we find that they sink in response to mechanical signals and chemical signals, and they land on coral reefs that are below them. However, if we look at fouling community organisms, this is the larva of a sea slug that lives in the fouling community. They're almost neutrally buoyant and they just hang out in the water and don't swim unless they start getting mechanical signals that a surface is nearby and then they start wiggling and swimming like a tadpole. And this is another fouling community, uh, community uh, organism, Hydroides elegans, a tomb worm. And they're like the little ever ready bunny. They always swim. They never stop swimming no matter what you do to them. So what we see is that the fouling community uh, organisms either initiate swimming or always swim, which is a good way to reach an unpredictable surface. So um, what can modeling do for me as a biologist? I uh, talked about our lar larval work to illustrate uh, these points. One is it allows me to run experiments that are not possible to do in the real world. Uh, both uh, technically, I can't see larvae uh, over the reef, and also I can give larvae other behaviors from the ones they actually show, like change their threshold of Q sensitivity. So that's a wonderful um, use of models for me. Models also tell me which parameters are most important and which ones uh, are not. And the important ones that the model indicates are important are the ones that are worth measuring or studying. 
And the other thing is that models enable me to test hypothesized mechanisms and general principles in a way that's much better than if I didn't have a model, because the model is a quantitative expression of an idea, which gives me quantitative testable predictions. So uh, this biologist's um, view of mathematical biology is much happier than uh, that of many of my colleagues because it's been a very powerful tool for me to collaborate with mathematicians like you guys. So uh, before I end, I have to share the blame for this work. It's a very multidisciplinary project. All the larval experiments and field work I did with Mike Hatfield at the University of Hawaii. And whenever we had trips to the coral reef, we always were able to get folks from our labs to participate. Uh, the flumes and laser experiments I did were with uh, uh, a biophysicist, Jules Jaffe, and two engineers, Matt Reidenbach and Jeff Kossoff. And the agent-based modeling that I told you about were done by my student, Jim Strother, my postdoc, Rachel Pepper, and my programmer, Tim Cooper, um, working with me. So I'll stop at this point and see if you have any questions. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Mimi. Just on behalf of everybody in the audience, I'll give you the round of applause. <laughs> Um, there were a couple questions along the way in the chat. I forgot to mention if anybody in the audience has questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll relay them. Uh, you actually answered some of the questions that were asked along the way. Um, so I'll, I'll get it started and I see there's one question that already came in. I'll go to that one next. But you were talking about, you know, how mathematicians can help with, you know, sensitivity with respect to parameters. One parameter that I saw in there was the, uh, the threshold for uh, either swim or don't swim, uh, you know, responding in an on-off way. Uh, was that threshold something that y'all qualitatively matched or was it something that you inferred from data? And do you have a sense for how much the results in terms of like um, settlement to, you know, the final result, you increase in 20% in settlement to the, to the reef um, with the on off kind of swimming, how sensitive is that to that threshold? Choice? Yeah, so um, let me just advance. Uh, I anticipated somebody might ask that. So let me just quickly go. Ignore these, I'm getting to the one you want. <laughs> Sharon, I see your question. Okay, so the model lets us vary parameters. So what I told you about was using measured values. So in the lab, we um, used different concentrations of the Q from the coral reef and determined what the threshold was to cause the velum to pull in. But uh, the model lets us vary parameters. So here's uh, an example of what we found. So this axis is transport improvement. And so what it is is the rate of transport of larvae into the reef for a particular set of parameters normalized to the rate of transport if there was no turbulence and if the larvae just swim all the time and don't respond to Q. And this is Q concentration threshold. So low Q concentration cause larvae to sink and high Q concentration cause larvae to sink. And this we have different flow data from different places. So we can vary the turbulence intensity as well. And so you see um, that the more turbulent is the greater the transport into the reef just passively because larvae are more are carried down to the reef in those eddies. But uh, sinking in Q enhances transport into the reef at all turbulence levels. And the actual value for the real larvae is shown by this little stick. So they're um, uh, sensitive enough to the uh, Q that they get a 20% uh, enhancement. You can see if they got much more sensitive, it would plateau at the levels of turbulence they encounter in the field. Very cool. Um, I I have a question from Sharon Lubkin, um, and she says, uh, so how are uh, the organisms sensing their motion? Do they have accelerometers, uh, shear sensors, via, or, or shear sensors via those uh, little hairy legs? Um, you had a graph whose acceleration magnitude was huge. Can the organism sense that? So um, these are experiments that we are, um, uh, in, uh, in the act of doing now. So um, to the, the larvae have what are called statuses, which are like our inner ears, so they can sense their own motion and um, sense which way is up. 
And they also have little hairs that stick out so they can sense fluid motion relative to their body. So we wanted to answer exactly that question. So we did a series of experiments where we could accelerate the larva and the water around it the same so that there was no water flow relative to the surface of the larva. So we shook an entire aquarium, either vertically or horizontally, and made videos of what the larvae did, and they ignore their own linear acceleration. So that's not the cue. Then we did a series of experiments where we spun the whole world, and any larvae in the very center of this spinning aquarium um, were only being spun. And we're in the process of analyzing those videos. So if they respond to their angular acceleration, we should know by the end of the summer uh, if we get through all those videos. And if that they don't respond to that either, then the only thing left is shear across the body. So we'll have to verify that by doing experiments where we tether a larva and squirt some water down one side and not the other and see what happens. We do know that they uh, respond to the um, pulses of, of water flow by um, uh, doing experiments in fluidic devices where we give them pulses. It's just that the pulse tumbles them, accelerates them, and exposes them to shear. But that's how we could calibrate how much of a pulse it took to get them to respond. Okay, cool. Um, there was one more question, and I think you somewhat clarified it. This came from Bard Ermintrout, where he, it was about the, the swimming rule for the model. You know, he asked, does it swim upward or just across? And I guess another way to ask it is, I remember that, that there's a, the larvae has a front. Does it just go, like, what's the definition of the front of a larvae? And does it just go in the direction that it's facing when, it, when it's in swim mode? So it swims in the direction, you know, it has Mickey Mouse ears, mm -hmm. and it swims uh, they're, they're sort of pullers. So it swims in the direction where the Mickey Mouse ears are pointing. And if you just have still water with competent larvae in the water, uh, Fred, they all swim in a straight line, but Fred may go this way and Louise may go that way and Mary may go a third direction. But once you put them in the turbulence, then their swimming direction is changed by the local vorticity. So that's how we came up with the direction. So when we start the model, we, give, we assign them a random swimming direction in, at uh, time uh, frame one. And then thereafter, the local vorticity affects that. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, if not, um, I want to thank you again. Uh, like, you know, once again, when, when I see these talks, there are just so many ideas. I, I, do, I guess I do have one more question for you while, uh, before you go. You made a mention that you prefer to use real life flow, real data, instead of fluid mechanics models. Is there a qualitative aspect of fluid mechanics simulations that don't quite get to the level of real flow in, in a, uh, uh, that, that leaves you dissatisfied as a biologist? Is there something that mathematicians could improve about fluid mechanics? With I haven't found anyone. So if anybody's listening and has such a model, contact me. But um, uh, we have rough substrata that inject uh, turbulence into flow that's already turbulent before it got to the reef or got to the fouling community. And we have a benthic boundary layer uh, with a velocity gradient in it. And um, we have odors coming off of the surface and being dispersed in that um, shear. And so when I've tried to work with people who want to model the flow, uh, what uh, they end up usually doing is getting an isotropic turbulence model and putting um, larvae into it. So we've done some interesting things in that sort of flow where we can look at how whether you swim or not, and whether you're elongate or spherical, affects how you um, are dispersed in isotropic turbulence. So we've published about that. But to get them in a boundary layer that's as complex as what we see, um, I haven't found anybody yet who has such a model we could put our larvae in. Um, but um, we'll, we'll consider that a dare for the community out there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mimi, well, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, uh, have a great Monday, everybody. <laughs>
Okay, stay safe and wash your hands. That's right.